We're just trying to keep you safe. <laughs> I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Isn't it good to be back in the house of the Lord? Amen. Even though some of us may look a little crazy. I will change before I come back out again. Just wanted you to know we're doing everything we can to keep you safe. And uh, just are so grateful you're here. And uh, just thought we'd do something a little different, a little special, just to get us going and sweating up a storm, actually. <laughs> So um, we've got a group of people who are going to lead us in some singing, and we've got a sermon, we've got communion today. We are so glad you're here. It's nice to look out and actually have people sitting here and not try to stare into a camera the whole time. And I might even get to move a little bit this morning, but it's just good to be here today and so thankful that you're able to join us. And for those of you at home who can't join us yet, we're thinking about you, we're praying for you, and we're glad you're joining us online. So let's have our team come up and let's just worship the Lord and have a good day in his house.
molded man from the dust of the earth and breathed his own breath of life into him. With every breath we breathe, let us praise and worship him. more normal. The other stuff may be the new norm. I don't know. Probably did. I, I, I don't doubt it for a minute. In case you couldn't hear, he said, I look better the other way. Thank you, Brad. Some things I just have not missed. <laughs> That's not one of them. I've, I've missed everybody here. You know, six months ago, we never heard of the word coronavirus. It was probably somewhere in the world, but not in our vocabulary. In the last several months, it's become the word that has dominated our vocabulary, our news, our lives, until, of course, the riots came. Now they're dominating, but coronavirus was the topic, and we're still trying to figure out things about it. 
But I don't want to talk about coronavirus today. I just want to introduce our thoughts for this morning. Because one thing that we've learned through this whole coronavirus stuff is there's a new norm coming. I don't know how many times I've heard that. I'm not even sure how many times I've said that in newsletter articles and even last week's sermon. There's a new norm coming. Nobody knows what it is. I'm not sure we'll know when it gets here. But everybody's talking about a new normal. I've probably gotten half a dozen or more articles on Facebook and through through email from various organizations talking about what's going to be the new normal for churches. They don't agree. I've been invited to several webinars, again, through Facebook and through email from organizations. They're going to have these conferences that you can attend free online and they're going to have experts tell us what's the new norm going to be. (laughs) They don't know. I mean, they have some good ideas. I mean, look around us. We've got a camera. We've been on TV. Well, not TV. We've been on Facebook for several weeks now. That's new. We've taped off several sections of the auditorium. That's new. As far as I know, we've not done that on a Sunday morning in the last five and a half years since I've been here. We're asking you, don't shake hands, don't hug, but if you do, we're not going to arrest you. But we're just having to do some things differently. Is this going to be the new norm? I have no clue. But this morning, rather than guess what the new norm is going to be, I want to focus on some things. Whoops. There we go. The new norm is learn how this works. (laughs) That was the old norm, actually. (laughs) Today I want to ask a question, what hasn't changed? There's a lot of things that are going to change, not just in church. I mean, professional sports is still trying to figure out what they're going to do this year. If anything, they're having a new norm and don't know how to handle it. Businesses are having to adjust how they do things. If you've ordered anything from Amazon recently, sit back and wait a while. It will eventually get here. But they're just not able to deliver as quickly as they used to. A lot of things have changed, but we need to understand in the church, there are some truths that just have not changed and will not change. The first one is God still rules. That hasn't changed. God still rules his world. He's still involved in his world. He still cares about us and cares about what's going on in the world. Now, that's not the God of the pagan world in the first century when Jesus was on the earth. In fact, there are some some Greek philosophers. And this was their belief about their gods. The gods are beautiful and happy and without thought of human affairs, eating and drinking and speaking Greek. Doesn't that sound like the life? Maybe not the speaking Greek part, but just to have no concern at all about what's going on in this world. That was the God of the Greeks and the Romans a God who's just indifferent to what's going on and has no concern at all and no involvement in what's going on. Their basic thought was, we're on our own, folks. Make the best of it. That idea has not gone away with the Greeks and the Romans. Back in, I believe, the 18th century, 19th century, I get these dates wrong, there was a Uh, an important philosopher by the name of Immanuel Kant. If you've ever had a course in introductory philosophy, you've been introduced to Immanuel Kant. He was a smart guy. But here was his concept of God. He said, we don't know if there's a God or not. We'll never know if there's a God or not, because if there is a God, He's behind some impenetrable barrier. He can't pass through that barrier to us, and we cannot pass through that barrier to him. So as far as Kant was concerned, here's what he said. We can posit the existence of God. 
but you can't know it for sure. He might be up there. He might not. We'll just never know. What kind of a God is that who has nothing at all to do with this world because he's too weak to pass through some impenetrable barrier? According to Kant, Jesus never came to earth as the God-man because he couldn't pass through that barrier either. So Kant would say in all of his philosophical descendants would say, well, yeah, there might be a God. Who knows? Who cares? We're on our own, folks. Even a lot of the fellows who, who designed this country and signed the Declaration of Independence, a lot of them were deists. The deists had a belief that said there is a God, and God created this world. But once he created this world, he wound it up like a clock, and now it's running down on its own, and God took a vacation. We have no idea where he is, but he has nothing to do with the affairs of this world. They were pretty smart guys. They just had a wrong view of God. What we need to understand is God still rules. He still is in control of this world. He still is involved with this world. In Acts chapter 17, verses 26 and 27, when Paul was speaking to the philosophers in Athens and telling them about this unknown God they were afraid of offending, as he's describing this God, he says, he made from one nation he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. That's the true God. Yes, he made the world. And Paul says he determined the allotment and the boundaries of nations. I, I take that to mean God has already decided how big nations and empires are going to be and how long they're going to be in existence. As you look back through world history, you sometimes wonder, why did this empire end when it did? They shouldn't have. They'd conquered everybody. But all of a sudden, it just ended. Why? Well, because God had said sometime in the past, you'll get this big, you'll last this long. And when you hit that time, someone else is going to take over. It's true of every country. It's true of every supposed world empire. You look at some of the battles in history and you think, how could they lose? They just hit their limit and God said, you're done. But God controls, God rules the world so that we might seek after him. He's not up there in heaven just moving chess pieces on the earth because he has nothing else to do. He's not just un, unconcerned about the human affairs, eating and drinking and speaking Greek. He is in our midst. He's not far from each one of us. C.S. Lewis put it this way. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. And one of the things we've noticed as we've looked at this whole coronavirus thing, there is a lot of pain. A lot of people are hurting for a lot of different reasons. Loss of life, loss of jobs, loss of a lot of things. And now with the riots, a whole lot more is being lost. But one thing people are noticing is in the midst of all this loss and pain, people are beginning to ask the question, is there a God? Does he have something to say to us? Yes, he does. He speaks to us. He shouts to us in our pain. And I believe with all the pain that's going on with the coronavirus and the riots and who knows what else may be tossed our way, God shouts to the world, I am still here. I am not far from any one of you. If you just reach out and feel a little bit, you can find me. And if there's a leader to lead the way, we can lead people to God. God still rules. That's a truth that has not changed and never will change. 
even when the world ends and heaven comes down and God establishes a new heaven and a new earth, he's still going to rule. That hasn't changed. Coronavirus has not affected that. A second truth that we can understand, and again, you can take this one to the bank. Jesus still saves. The coronavirus has not affected the blood of Jesus Christ to make it ineffective. He still saves. We used to sing a song. We sing it on occasion. I know we've sung it here. If you want to follow the words yourself, it's page 306. But it's a grand old hymn of the church, Jesus Saves. Listen to these words of the writer. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward, tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Waft it on the rolling tide. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Tell to sinners far and wide. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Sing ye islands of the sea. Echo back ye ocean caves. Earth shall keep her jubilee. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. By his death and endless life, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom when the heart for mercy craves. Sing in triumph or the tomb, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. That's still true. His death was almost 2,000 years ago, but the effect is still going on today. Jesus still saves. He'll only be the Savior until he comes back the second time, but until then, we have the opportunity to share with people the news. Jesus saves. And that leads us into the third truth that hasn't changed. We still have a mission. Before Jesus went back to heaven, he said to his apostles, Go into all the world and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Make disciples. That has always been the mission of the church and still is. We never want to lose sight of that mission. Several years ago, we adopted our, not our version, but a mission statement for this church. We used to have it posted, then for good reasons, we took it down, and I just haven't promoted our mission statement. I need to get back to doing that. Our, commi- our mission statement as a church is this, building a community to reach the world. That's our version of the Great Commission. That's how we see it. That's our purpose here. That is our mission, to be building a community of people to reach the world. That's why we're here. Now, building a community, you know, building is the idea. It's an ongoing thing. We'll never be able to say in the history of this church, well, we've built that community. We're done. No, it's always an ongoing thing, always building the community of Jesus Christ. And that involves a couple of things. One, we're talking about numerical growth. And sometimes people get upset. Why do you talk about numbers? Well, because God's concerned about numbers. 
You look in the Old Testament in the, in the sojourn through the wilderness. At the beginning, God said, number the people. At the end, he said, count them again. And several times in their history, Israel was counted because God was concerned with how many there were and, and what they were going to do. As you read through the early chapters of Acts, God was concerned to know how many disciples there were. They began with 120 in the upper room. Then on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were added to the 120. And then later it was 5,000. Then it talked about multitude of people. And then multitudes of people. It got so many, he couldn't count them. But God said, just understand, there are multitudes and when you look in the book of Revelation and talk about the end times, God's still talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people and an innumerable multitude of people. God is concerned about numbers because numbers represent people. And God is concerned about people. And his church needs to be concerned about people as well. Part of our mission in building a community is finding people who need to become a part of this community of Christ. We all have that responsibility. Now, I've said this before, and I'll say it many times afterwards. Just because we invite somebody to church doesn't mean they're going to come. The chances are if we don't invite them, it's a higher likelihood they're not going to come. We've all been turned down. We've all been rejected. Well, just remember this. Everybody Jesus invited to follow and listen to him didn't follow him either. You're in good company if you invite people to see Jesus and they don't listen to you. That puts you in good company. It doesn't mean we stop. We want to be building up the numbers of this community because numbers represent people and people represent Souls that need to be saved and come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That ought to be in all of our minds sometime. Is there somebody groping in the darkness? Is there someone to whom God is shouting in their pain? That maybe I can invite them to be a part of a community that loves them and cares for them and honors them and does what we can to help them. That's the community we are to be. But there's also another side of building the community. That is the spiritual growth and spiritual maturity that God expects of all of us. We need to work, and it is work at growing. Now, some of us are growing physically. It doesn't take any work at all. And that's understandable. But to grow spiritually requires some work. For example, Paul writes to Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that's not, that can handle God's word accurately. The idea there, even though Paul wasn't thinking of our armies, can you imagine drafting somebody into the army? They go through basic training, but you never give them a gun. And the day they graduate from basic training, they're sent to the front lines. Oh, by the way, here's a gun. Good luck. Well, if it's somebody that's raised in a community like this, they've shot a gun before. They, they understand what they're doing. But, you know, there are a lot of folk raised in communities. They've never held a gun in their life. Can you imagine sending somebody out on the front line with a gun? They say, which end do I aim? You don't want to be standing next to that person in, <laughs> on the front line. No, you train them how to use the gun. You aim this end. You look through here. You aim there. You pull this trigger. Here's how you take it apart. Here's how you clean it. Here's how you put it back together. And then can you do it in this many seconds? Can you do it while you're blindfolded? You've got to become familiar with your weapon. Well, the Bible is our weapon. And what Paul is telling Timothy is this. Study God's word so you can handle it like if he were alive today, a soldier is taught how to handle his gun. It's got to become a part of you. What do you suppose would happen if you decided for the rest of your life you just wanted to eat one meal a week? Oh, it's a good meal. 
It's well balanced. It's got all the nutrition that you need. It's got the right amount of calories that you need to fit your body. But suppose you ate that one meal, got away from the table, and said, I'm not going to eat till next week at this time. What kind of life would you live? How long would you live? And yet, when you think about it, that's what a lot of Christians do. We eat one meal a week. We come to church. Someone's prepared a meal for us. Some weeks it's better than others. We understand all of that. But then we go home and, well, I've eaten my meal for the week. I'll wait till next week and get back, and then I'll have another meal. No wonder we are spiritually immature when we don't take the time to study God's Word. Now, a little over a year ago, we partnered with this outfit called Right Now Media. Some of you have subscribed to Right Now Media. You know what I'm talking about. Others of you are sitting here, oh, Right Now Media, what in the world is that about? It's a company that has put together, oh, they're probably up around 20,000 videos now of various sorts of Bible studies for all ages, all groups, all topics. And you can subscribe to that for free. And anytime you want, you can pull up Right Now Media and do a Bible study. You can do it on your own. If you type this in, HTTP, bit.ly, FCCCP, it will bring up a, an application. Just fill it in. They want you to establish your own username, your own password. Most of us have done that before. There's one or two other questions, and finally at the bottom it will say, do you have an affiliation with First Christian Church? Just say yes. If you're here, you have an affiliation. If you see me online, you have an affiliation. You may never attend this church, but I'm glad you do. But there are folk out there in, in wherever they are who might not be able... <clears throat> Whoa. who might not be able to attend this church, but just the fact that you know, do bitly, <laughs> you have an affiliation with this church. And once you do that, you'll get a confirmation email, and then you can access Right Now Media, rightnowmedia.org. Thousands and thousands of videos, Bible studies, movies, kids, things for kids. I encourage you, now, the church is paying for it, but it doesn't cost you a thing. You know, if, you, if you're in Netflix, that costs you what, about $13 a month. And a lot of stuff on Netflix isn't worth watching. Sorry to say that. It just, it's not going to encourage you and help you grow as a Christian. It might entertain you, but it's not going to help feed you as a Christian. Right now, media, all kinds of stuff available to help you grow in your Christian life. It's just amazing how much stuff is out there. And they're adding things every month. New studies, new videos, new movies even. You can watch it on your own. Just pick a time, pull it up, say, oh, there's a study on the book of Philippians. I think I'll try that. You may watch the first video. They're usually about 8 to 15 minutes. Some of them are a little bit longer, but most of them are very short. You may watch it and say, hmm, I don't like that one. Well, there's 19,999 more you can choose from. You'll find something that you like, something that benefits you. Or if you like, since we're not having Sunday school or other small groups for the time being, four or five or six of you might get together and say, let's do a study together. You might pick on, pick a video and say, let's watch that one. You know, there's, there's four videos. Let's watch one video each week, and at a certain time, we'll, we'll get together on Zoom. I mean, you do all this at home. We'll have a Zoom meeting. Zoom is free, by the way. Gives you 40 minutes. After 40 minutes, you're cut off. But you can start right back up again. Or you can pay a subscription fee and not get cut off. But why pay? It's free. And you can get together, the three or four or five of you can agree to meet on Zoom at a certain time and you can see each other and hear each other. And you can discuss the video that you watched and you can ask each other questions. You can get real personal if you want. Did you hear what the person said here? Yeah, I heard that. What do you think it means? I think it means this. Are you doing that? Click, I think I'm off. <laughs> 
You don't need a preacher to lead that. You can do that on your, on your own. I mean, all kinds of things are available to help us feed ourselves throughout the week. I encourage all of you here, subscribe to Right Now Media. We pay a certain price each month because we're a certain size church. When we first joined, I said, well, we're about 55 to 60 people. I said, okay, here's your cost per month. I said, what if, she said, we don't care, same price. Now, if we start with 1,000 people, the price is so much higher, but by starting at 55 to 60, we've got a low price, and it was just reduced a few weeks ago. They gave us a break for reasons, but it's there to help us grow in our Christian faith, to build ourselves up in the faith, to become stronger and more mature Christians. And now, because of the media, we can do this. And Can you imagine what the world would have been like if Paul had Zoom available to him? Philemon, join me on Zoom at this time. i got some things to say to you. I'm glad he wrote them. But can you imagine what Paul could have done if he had Zoom or, or Facebook Live or YouTube where he could record his sermons and play them for the world? Who knows what he might have accomplished? I mean, it's great what he did with what he had. We've got better tools than even the Apostle Paul had in terms of spreading the gospel and helping us grow and become stronger in our spiritual walk. I can't encourage you enough to get hooked up with Right Now Media. All it takes is a little bit of time, a little bit of technical ability, but if you've ever signed up for a subscription service, you already know how to do it. Probably use the same password. I don't know. That's up to you. But that's what we need to work on as Christians, is building up our community in numbers and in maturity so that as a result, we can reach a lost world. We don't want to build up just for the sake of saying, hey, we're, we're at 75 now. Aren't we doing great? We're at 90 now. Boy, man, we're really zooming. No, it's not for ourselves. It's so that we can reach the world that needs to know Jesus Christ. And when Jesus was leaving his disciples there in Acts chapter 1, he gave them an outline. He said, begin in Jerusalem and go to Judea, then Samaria, and then the uttermost part of the earth. Start in your neighborhood, start in the area where you you live, you're comfortable, you know the culture, you know the language, then cross over the cultural barriers to Samaria, and then go to the uttermost part of the earth. We have a mission to begin in our Jerusalem of inviting people to know Jesus Christ. Introduce them to Right Now Media and ask them, would you, would you watch a study with me? I'd like to talk with you about it. Find something that's not too threatening and just kind of beginning to understand who Jesus is. Would you mind studying this with me? Let's just watch the videos and then talk about it. That's easy enough. We need to encourage folk in our church. You know, you've done this in the past. I was just trying to go through some of the names this past week of some of the folk this church has sent out into the Jerusalem and Judea and crossing cultural barriers in Samaria and even across international. I'm not going to come up with all the names. Greg Lee, Jeff Bent, I think Randy White is in there, Jessica Pease at the time, Clevenger now. Um, Brandon Llewellyn, Logan Myers. Look where they wound up. (laughs) They're in Jerusalem. (laughs) Working for the kingdom. Who knows who's next? It's not just high school kids. You know, when Jesus called disciples, he didn't call 18-year-old high school kids. He called men with families. He said, you come and follow me. Some of you may think, oh, I'm exempt from that now. I'm married. I've got a family. Yeah, God said, that's the ones I can really use. I don't know how God may call you and use you. 
that I hope this church becomes a supporting, sending, encouraging congregation. Have you considered ministry? Have you considered serving Christ in some way? In our series from 1 John, how do we grow? How do we reach out, love God, obey his commandments, and serve him? If we do that on a regular basis and feed ourselves more than once a week, we're going to become that community that's building and growing here that we can reach the world for Jesus Christ. Here's some questions we have to ask. Do you truly believe that God still rules this world? Do you believe he's in control of events? It doesn't mean he causes them. But he's got everything under control, moving toward one day in history when he's going to come back in the form of Jesus Christ and say, I told you, I'm coming back. Are you ready? Do you believe that Jesus still saves? Have you accepted him personally? Are you sharing that news with others? Jesus saves. And are you committed to being a community that builds and grows together so that we can reach a lost world, some of whom are groping in the darkness as God shouts to them in their pain. We have a story to tell to the nations. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. That's my vision for this church. It has been since I've been here. It's still my vision for this church that this is what God will Enable us to become as we work together and grow together and serve together and love together. That we can become a community to reach the world. Would you pray with me? Father, we, we are grateful that you have done everything you need to do to enable us to become your family, your church. And you've given us the opportunity to be your people. In these past couple of months when the churches have been closed, we've heard numerous people say the church is not a building. We're still doing church. We're still being the church. And that's true. But now that we're meeting back together in this place, help us to understand it's still important to be the church and to do what the church is supposed to do. Oh, God, give us a vision of people groping after you in the darkness and help us be the people there to lead them to where you are. You are in this world and you are controlling things so that we might find you because you're not far from any one of us. <clears throat> and for those of us who have found you through Jesus Christ, oh God, may we feel the burden of sharing that news with others who need to know him as well. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Our team is going to lead us in a communion song. Uh, when I survey the wondrous cross, three verses, and then we'll have a meditation and give some further instruction for our communion service. <laughs>
The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When I was in high school, one of my favorite classes was Latin, of all things. I really enjoyed Latin because we had a really neat Latin teacher. We used to accuse him of having been there with Julius Caesar. He wasn't, of course, but that's what we said, occasionally to his face. But one of the things he would do that was so interesting is each week when we walk into class, he'd have a different Latin motto on the board. We would memorize that motto in the translation, and then that would help us learn some Latin words. And one week we walked in, and it looked like on the board it said, respice, add spice, pro spice. You know, it was a little bit early, and we thought, what, the Spice Girls? Of course, they weren't a group yet, but. Now he said you pronounce it respice, adspice, prospice. So we learned how to pronounce respice, adspice, prospice. Okay, what in the world does it mean? Look back, look to the present, and look to the future. Well, that's kind of neat. And one day it dawned on me, that's what communion asks us to do. Look back at the sacrifice that Jesus made. And remind ourselves he did this because he loves us and because we needed it. Communion is a time to look back, to see what Christ has done. Look at the present. Paul says, examine yourself and see, how am I doing in my Christian walk? This is a great time of personal introspection and evaluation of myself. How have I done this past week as a Christian? Some weeks will be pretty good. Some weeks, ooh, this wasn't a good week. It's just a good time to remind ourselves this is an ongoing thing. But Paul says, don't forget, communion is also a time to look to the future. It reminds us that Jesus Christ is coming back. And are we ready for him? And are we doing everything we can to have other people ready to receive him as well? Whether he comes in our lifetime or whether he waits a million years, it doesn't matter. As we partake communion, Paul says, one of the things we are doing is saying to the world, we guarantee he's coming back. And we can make that guarantee because he said it first. And his death and resurrection proves that everything he said is true. So in this time of communion, take a little time to look at the past. Remember what Christ did. Take a look at the present. How am I doing in my life with Christ? Is there anything I need to change? And then look to the future. He is coming back, and we're looking forward to that time. Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for this communion service. In many ways, it's just so simple. A little piece of some kind of bread, a little cup of juice, doesn't seem like much. And yet when we see beyond the physical and see what it stands for, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the promise that someday he's coming back, this is a much more meaningful service than just adult snack during church. Father, help us to take the time to review ourselves and examine ourselves and see how am I standing in the faith? Anything I can do differently, anything I can improve. And help me, Lord, to do that between now and the time Jesus comes. And let us remember his death and resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you once again for joining us this week for our worship service. It was really good to be live in the building today, and we're sorry you couldn't make it, but we know there's a lot of reasons why you couldn't. As your circumstances change, perhaps you'd like to join us here in our church building, 10 o'clock every Sunday morning. We'll be here. But if you're not able to join us, uh, we understand. And if you'd like to contact the church, if you have any questions or anything you'd like to know, there's one of the slides coming up that has our phone number. It has our email address. Someone's usually here Monday through Friday morning until noon. That's the best time to contact us. So again, thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we sincerely hope you have a great week this week. God bless you.